All right, I wanted to finish up on reefs, and some of this is stuff that you saw on Friday, or that you uh, may or may not remember. Uh, some of this might be a little bit redundant, but I was able to get, if nothing else, some slightly better pictures. So we've talked about reefs. To a sailor, a reef is anything you can run your ship into. No. You can run aground on a reef that could be just some submerged rocks or something like that. To a biologist, a reef has a framework made up of the skeletons of living things. And you can have reefs that are primarily made of algae, reefs that are made of sponges, uh, reefs that are made of segmented worms and things like that. Uh, but the uh, best known type of reef is the tropical coral reef. And corals, if you recall, look like this. They are colonial animals. Each individual is basically a bag of tissue with a mouth and polyps, uh, sorry, tentacles around the mouth uh, called a polyp. And the polyps are connected to each other by sheets of tissue. And under the sheets, the tissue lays down layers of calcium carbonate, uh, building it up year by year. In fact, coral reefs, as they grow, have growth rings similar to, uh, to trees. And in fact, you can date uh, pieces of coral and use chemical signals from pieces of coral to measure changes in uh, some environmental conditions year by year, much the same way you could do with growth rings. Uh, this, by the way, is a whole bunch of corals reproducing sexually. Uh, they are releasing, uh, uh, those are egg cells in synchrony. A whole bunch of polyps are uh, releasing egg cells all at once in, you know, one great big uh, fell swoop. And uh, they'll also release sperm. And egg and sperm will, you know, do what eggs and sperm do. And the fertilized egg will develop into a larva. I should mention that corals can also reproduce asexually. Um, a broken piece of coral can regenerate a new colony. Uh, this tends to happen a lot when you have hurricanes or typhoons hitting a coral reef. Uh, they can break down a lot of the coral, and it can look pretty bad at first, but broken pieces of the coral can go on to seed uh, new, larger coral colonies. Uh, so if it's just a storm, uh, coral reefs can often recover uh, fairly quickly. So the fertilized eggs, uh, there's one labeled egg at uh, the upper left. Uh, the egg divides into two cells, four cells, 16, 32, 64, dot, dot, dot. Uh, develops into a little sheet of cells, um, which in this paper is called a prawn chip. You know, that's like the shrimp chips that you get at, um, well, around here at Mount Fuji Sushi Restaurant, those crunchy things that you eat. Uh, that folds in to form a larval type called a gastrula, and the gastrula forms a creeping, uh, vaguely worm-like larva called a planula, and the planula will drop to the bottom, and it may crawl for some time before it transforms into a new polyp. Uh, so corals reproduce sexually that way, uh, corals can disperse this way because those planktonic larvae may float for some time before they finally settle down. And we were talking about how corals are colonial. That's not entirely true. There are some corals that only form single polyps and never form colonies. Uh, this is one. This is a so-called mushroom coral. Uh, some species are very elongated and are called banana corals. This one's called fungia. And a nice long banana coral can get up to maybe a foot long or so. So, so these can get pretty big. Uh, but they don't truly form reefs. 
uh, because they never form these colonies that can get so much bigger than any single polyp can. And then we have to let somebody in. Do, 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 do. Um, right, there we go. But most reef building corals, as they grow, uh, they'll start growing by budding and new polyps will form. As that colony gets larger and larger, and the cor and the tissue collectively lays down that new coral material. Underneath each individual polyp, there's a little socket called a coralite, and the polyp can shrink down into the coralite, which they'll often do. Well, they'll do it if they're startled, or sometimes many reef corals will just kind of shrink down into the coralite during the day and then emerge from it at night to feed. And the coralites can be arranged in various ways. Uh, there's a number of different uh, technical names for them. Up top, there's a serioid coral and a plocoid coral at the lower left. Uh, the coralites sometimes fuse into these elongated rows, and the rows kind of wind around each other and give you a texture that superficially resembles a brain. Uh, so brain corals look the way they do because they are, they've got these fused coralites. Uh, the polyps all kind of come together into these very uh, long rows, and we call that meandroid uh, coral growth. Now, we talked about different types of reefs, and I spent most of um, Friday's lecture talking about the growth of atolls. Atolls are those reefs in the open ocean that are shaped like rings. And we talked about how they start as reefs on the flanks of volcanic islands. And as the volcanic island erodes, and as it may also sink down, the island drops down while the reefs grow straight upwards. They're always going to grow up towards the light, uh, like plants in that regard. The end result is you go from a big volcanic island with a fringing reef to a smaller volcanic island with a barrier reef, and then ultimately to an atoll, this ring-shaped uh, coral island uh, with a lagoon in the center, but no volcano sticking out at all. So atolls form by that sequence. Coastal reefs follow the coastline of a larger landmass, and those can be patch reefs, fringing reefs, or barrier reefs. And then platform reefs don't necessarily lie close to a coast. And there's a nice example of one uh, that's quite close to here, if by quite close you mean about 500 miles. Uh, so here's an aerial view of Belize, and it's mostly sand on the bottom, but you can see these kind of irregular patches of uh, kind of brown stuff. Uh, some of it is just above the water level. Um, I guess this was taken at low tide. Uh, some of it is submerged a bit, but these are patch reefs. Uh, they're surrounded by these zones of, in this case, it's sand. In other parts of the ocean, there might be seagrass in between. So they're patch reefs because they look patchy. Duh. Hello. And then when you have reefs that come together, instead of being patchy, um, but don't have any gap between the reef and the shoreline, uh, you have a fringing reef. And there's a satellite view of a part of Hawaii that happens to be on the Hawaiian island of Molokai. Uh, but when I went to Hawaii, I saw uh, several reefs like this. I think I might have mentioned, it might have been to a different class that I mentioned when I was in sixth grade, we went to Hawaii and at this place we stayed on the island of Maui, 
uh, you could, there was a little beach, and if you waded off the beach, you could get right onto the reef and walk over it. Uh, this was where I discovered that uh, type of marine invertebrates called sea cucumbers uh, breathe through their anuses, and if you picked them up, they would shoot streams of water out of their anuses. And I discovered that you could squirt your little sister that way and really freak her out by squirting water out of a sea urchin anus. And this tells you probably a lot of, this probably says a lot about me. Uh, but anyway, that was a fringing reef, one where there's no real gap between the reef and the shoreline in particular. And that's what one of these looks like. This is, oh, this is an awesome place to visit. Uh, it's a state park, and you can see this beautiful fringing reef. Uh, you can see there's a beach, and then, if, you know, once you get down from the beach to the waterline, boom, you've got fringing reefs starting right there from the beach all the way up to that white line, which shows you where the waves are breaking. Uh, that's the fringing reef at Hanauma Bay in Oahu. Uh, these days, it's, you know, these days, there's a pandemic on. Uh, before that, it was so popular that you needed reservations to go, but it's a terrific place to go skin diving. You just need a snorkel and fins, and you can swim around on the reef and see all these amazing fish and have one of them uh, bite your thumb when you haven't brought them any food. Uh, that happened to me. I got bitten by a trigger fish. And uh, it's just an incredible time if you ever get to go. Uh, but anyway, that's a nice example of a fringe, fringing reef. And I, I think I can see some patch reefs out in the distance. And then there's the Great Barrier Reef of Australia. Okay, sorry about the accent. And you can see there's a rather wide lagoon, I think a couple of miles wide, uh, between the landmass at the lower left and the main crest of the Great Barrier Reef itself. Uh, notice within the lagoon, you get some little patch reefs. There's little specks of reef uh, in all that blue space between the Great Barrier Reef itself and the Australian mainland. Uh, so that's what we mean by a barrier reef. And remember, on an atoll, you would start with a volcanic island that might begin to grow a few patch reefs. Those would tend to grow together and become a fringing reef. And as the island slowly sinks, while the coral reefs grow upwards, you go from a fringing reef to a barrier reef, and then ultimately to an atoll when there's no island in the middle at all. Platform reefs grow pretty much in all directions, and they're not particularly close to a coastline. One of the things that's happening from the Gulf of Mexico all the way to southern Arkansas is there's a very deeply buried layer of rock salt um, under... Um, I'm not sure how far... something like a mile deep. Uh, covered up by other layers of rock and sediment. And the reason I can tell you it goes all the way to South Arkansas is that rock salt is funny. Rock salt is solid at, you know, surface temperatures and pressures. It's a, well, rock. Uh, you grind it up into powder and you can sprinkle it on your food, of course, or put it on the streets to keep uh, ice from building up. But when you put solid salt under very heavy pressure, it starts to flow. Uh, it behaves very differently when you compress it under a mile of overlying layers of rock and sediment, and it'll start flowing like very thick toothpaste. And one of the effects is that if there's any little crack in the sediments overlying the rock salt layer, the rock salt will push its way up through the cracks and form these deep structures like giant pillars of salt punching their way through 
the overlying rocks, and those are called salt domes. The reason this matters for reasons other than the ocean is you can get salt domes on land, and the sides of salt domes, for reasons I won't get into, are often very good places to go drilling for oil. And you might know that we mine salt water in South Arkansas. Um, the Arkansas deep underground salt water has a high concentration of the chemical element bromine, uh, which has some industrial uses. Uh, that's ultimately from this deep layer of salt called the Luan salt. Um, and of course, we also drill oil uh, down around Smackover and El Dorado. And this deep salt layer is also why there's lots of oil in uh, South Louisiana um, and offshore in the Gulf of Mexico. The edges of these uh, deeply buried salt columns are uh, often they tend to trap oil and they're good places to drill for it. Where was I going with this? Right. So you have these very deep-seated pillars of salt called salt domes that are pushing their way up through the crust. And in some areas, they can actually create islands. I used to go to this place all the time. There's an island called Avery Island um, in South Louisiana, which happens to be where Tabasco sauce is made and bottled. Uh, we used to go there on school field trips a lot. And it's actually pretty, you know, it's a couple hundred feet high, which by South Louisiana standards is quite a lot. There's also places where that salt is pushed up and formed the shallow areas in the middle of the Gulf of Mexico. They're not tall enough to break the surface, but they are shallow enough that they're in what we call the photic zone, the area where there's enough light for photosynthesis to take place. And there's a couple of these in the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, just by looking, I'd say that's probably 100, 150 miles offshore. Uh, they're called flower garden banks. And the water's shallow enough that there are some rich coral reef communities growing on the top of these undersea hills, uh, growing on the top of these salt domes. A uh, beautiful place to go diving if you're into that sort of thing, uh, even if it is a bit expensive to, uh, uh, to, to get you out there. I think it takes, um, you know, it takes several hours for a boat to get out that far. Um, and these are protected, by the way, uh, as part of uh, Flower Garden Bank's uh, National Marine Sanctuary. Uh, so this would be a case of a platform reef uh, where the corals are pretty much growing all over the surface of that, and they're not close to a coastline. They're not really affected in how they grow by the presence of a coast. In coral reefs, you'll actually create multiple environmental zones. Um, each one has distinct niches. Uh, there may be a lagoon uh, in a barrier reef or an atoll, uh, there'd be a shallow lagoon. From there, that tends to rise to a crest uh, called the reef crest, obviously enough, uh, which may be dominated by algae because the water may be too shallow for corals to be comfortable. Um, moving away from the land, from the reef crest, you get the four reef zone, and then you may drop down, uh, down the reef wall. Uh, which may go down until there is not enough light for photosynthesis to take place. And these all are different niches. They all have different environmental conditions. Uh, so there we go. Uh, there's the shore. Uh, assuming this is a barrier reef and not a, uh, or I guess this could be a fringing reef. Um, the reef flat may be exposed at low tide. Uh, this is what I was walking on when I was picking up those sea cucumbers and squirting my sister with the water that they shoot out of their anuses. Uh, that rises to the reef crest. That's often where the waves are going to be breaking. Uh, 
And then the fore reef facing the ocean is exposed to the most wave action. Um, the waves will be breaking on that reef crest and a lot of their energy is going to be expended hitting the reef crest and the fore reef. And algae may dominate there because the corals may be too delicate to grow. Um, that reef crest is not only exposed to waves, it's also often exposed to air at low tide. Uh, this is one coral that actually does all right on the reef crest, Acropora cervicornis. And this is one of the ones where if a branch breaks off, it'll just grow into a new colony. Uh, so this one is actually pretty well adapted to getting hit by waves on a regular basis. The lagoon can also be a pretty harsh environment uh, because it's receiving runoff from land where you get a river flowing from the land into the ocean. You may not get corals at all. There may just be too much mud and the water may not be saline enough. Um, in the lagoon, this isn't necessarily the case, but every time you do get rain, water is going to run from the land into the lagoon. It'll carry some silt, so the water's not going to be as clear, and the salinity may fluctuate a lot, uh, especially in the tropics where the main seasons are not cold versus hot. You know, it's always nice and warm, the main seasonal alteration may be dry versus rainy. So on one of your tropical coral islands, you might get very heavy rains for part of the year, which will tend to make the lagoons more fresh, uh, and then very little rain for another part of the year, which means the lagoons are gonna get increasingly saline. Uh, so the, re yeah, the reef lagoon may not be the, is not the most diverse habitat uh, because it's environmentally stressed. Corals tend to be at their most diverse um, on the fore reef, right, the side facing the open ocean, at about 15 to 20 meters deep. Uh, that's below uh, what we call wave base. Uh, that's the depth at which you feel wave action. Um, wave action gets weaker and weaker the deeper down you go. Um, I had friends doing scuba diving uh, training uh, who would go out in pretty rough weather and it can be really hard, you know, swimming around on the surface uh, when you've got big waves going past. Uh, but then as you dive, once you got down about 50 feet, uh, they didn't feel any of that. Um, the energy from wave passage dissipates as you go deeper down. And so once you're at about 15 to 20 meters deep, you're not feeling that wave activity and corals can grow uh, with much less disturbance uh, once you get down below wave base. And then the reef wall may look like this and that can go down and down and down until there's finally not enough light uh, to support photosynthetic corals. Um, and of course, below that, there may be non-photosynthetic corals. You know, as we talked about, there are some deep water types of reef, uh, like those deep coral reefs off the coast of Norway or those sponge reefs off the coast of British Columbia. Um, but coral reefs as such, tropical type coral reefs uh, need to have light. And eventually you pass out of the photic zone which means it gets too dark for photosynthesis to take place, and then you don't get corals anymore. Now, we talked earlier about how when corals are stressed, um, corals depend on these single-celled algae uh, called zooxanthellae living inside their tissues. Um, the zooxanthellae carry out photosynthesis. They get a place to live. Uh, the coral periodically harvests them uh, and gets nutrition for itself. Uh, some corals are so good at this that they no longer feed. Um, when corals are under stress, they may end up kicking out their symbionts, and we call this bleaching. Uh, 
and here's some bleached coral up in the foreground uh, with some non-bleached coral in the background. Uh, bleached corals are still alive, uh, but they've lost up to 90% of their food supply. Uh, they're that dependent on zooxanthellae. They may be able to recover if they can retain or regain their zooxanthellae. Uh, they can pick them up from their surroundings. If that doesn't happen, they are likely to die. One of the one of many undesirable effects of global climate change is increased um, ocean temperatures, and that is leading to increased degrees of coral bleaching. Uh, between 2014 and 2017, we had elevated ocean temperatures due to the El Nino cycle. And this is, you're looking at um, uh, areas of the ocean that are most affected by warmer temperatures. Uh, that um, red area that's shaded in encompasses 70% of the world's coral reefs. Um, one of the things that might make you not sleep so easily is that when we look at the fossil record, uh, when we go back and dig up fossils, including fossil corals, which you can find uh, even in Arkansas in spots, one of the things that we see when we look at the fossil record is whenever we get a mass extinction, the reefs take it hard on the chin. Um, after the mass extinction 245 million years ago, the Earth went through about 10 million years when there weren't any reefs at all. And the corals that evolved after the extinction were actually different from the corals that had existed before. Those all died. Uh, the reefs got hammered 65 million years ago in the same mass extinction that ended uh, the dinosaurs, except for the birds. Um, the reefs also got pretty badly hit, and there was a lot of extension, ex extinction, sorry, extinction of reef building taxa. And reefs may be, if you don't mind me mixing my biological metaphor, they may be the canary in the coal mine, uh, in that they tend to be sensitive to certain types of rapid environmental change. And it seems to be happening now. 70% of the world's coral reefs uh, have suffered from bleaching. Um, in the Pacific region, corals also suffer from outbreaks of a um, starfish uh, called the crown of thorn starfish, Acanthaster plancae. Starfish have this amazing way of feeding in that they can turn their stomach inside out, stick it out through their mouths, and digest and absorb food outside their bodies. Um, some starfish specialize in pulling clams open and inserting their stomachs in between the clam's shells and digesting the clam right there. Uh, but a canthaster plancae just crawls over coral and turns its stomach inside out and slurps up um, uh, the coral, digests it right there and absorbs it right there. Uh, you might remember that starfish are also fairly good at regenerating pieces. Uh, some species can regenerate uh, if you cut one in two, uh, the halves might develop into new starfish. There's a story that back in the 1950s, there was an outbreak of Acanthaster plancae on the Great Barrier Reef, and some Australians went out in a boat and picked up as many crown of thorn starfish as they could find. And at the end of the day, they had a boat full of crown of thorn starfish and they didn't really have a use for them. They're not useful for anything. In fact, if you step on one, you'll get, um, there's some venom on those spines. It's not lethal, but it'll, it'll hurt. And they couldn't figure out what to do with all the starfish they gathered. So they cut them into pieces and dumped them back in the ocean. Oops. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so anyway, there have been periodic population explosions hitting Pacific reefs. Uh, there was one case in the Philippines where 87,000 starfish were collected from just one beach. That's connected with, seems to be connected with episodes of nutrient runoff from the land. So if you've got farms on the land and there's a rainstorm that carries fertile soil and fertilizer into the ocean, that seems to be correlated with population explosions of crown of thorn starfish. Each one of these explosions can wipe out 90% of the coral in the affected region. Uh, this was an outbreak on the island of Morea in French Polynesia. Up at the top, uh, that's a healthy coral reef. Um, in the photo from 2009, after the crown of thorn starfish outbreak, it looks about the same, but the corals are dead. And they're overgrown by green algae. And then in 2010, there was a cyclone that broke down the dead coral skeletons, leaving only the algae to recolonize the place. Uh, on the Great Barrier Reef, it takes about eight to 10 years for corals to replace uh, the algae, and I assume the time frame in French Polynesia would be much the same. And this, of course, means that you don't only well, come on, Wagoner, you don't only lose the corals because the corals are ecosystem engineers. They create a great number of habitats, the little nooks and crannies and crevices where fish and shrimp and things like that can crawl into. Uh, they create this you know, spatial complexity, this complex environment where living things can you know, crawl away or burrow into. Uh, there are fish that can actually eat corals. Uh, the humphead parrotfish in particular um, can take, has these huge powerful jaws and can just bite off great big masses of coral, chew them up, and excrete the coral skeleton in the form of sand. So yeah, it's a fish that eats coral and poops sand. And that in itself creates a new niche because you have living things that can make a living in that coral sand uh, created by the humphead parrotfish. So when you lose the corals, you lose all that. You lose your ecosystem engineers. And on the Great Barrier Reef, um, after a cyclone like this, it takes about eight to 10 years for the corals to grow back. And between that and bleaching, corals may not have a chance to grow back. And as I mentioned, population explosions of Acanthaster plancae uh, correlate with episodes of increased nutrient runoff. Uh, this happens naturally when there's heavy rainfall, but agriculture can make it worse. Um, there are fish that will eat Acanthaster plancae. Uh, anything that affects those may also play a role in crown of thorn starfish outbreaks. The reason this might actually matter, other than the fact that life is beautiful and life is diverse and life is really cool to go skin diving on if you are a sixth grader frolicking at Hanauma Bay, Hawaii. There was a study done in 2003 that estimated that if you could preserve all of the world's reefs just as they were in 2003, they would generate nearly $6 billion worth of seafood each year. Uh, there are lots of perfectly edible fish and shellfish that live on coral reefs or may at least uh, grow on coral reefs, even if they end up moving elsewhere as adults you'd have $9 billion put into the economy in protecting coast from storm damage. Uh, reefs absorb all of that wave energy, which means that your beach, ha beach house doesn't absorb all of that wave energy. And if it's healthy, they can grow back after that, as we've seen. And it's not $9 billion that could actually be put into someone's pocket, but it's $9 billion 
that insurance companies don't have to pay out $9 billion, that insurance companies don't have to charge in premiums $9 billion that nobody has to spend in rebuilding and restoring flood damage property. So it's not so much that you gain $9 billion, it's that you don't lose $9 billion. Uh, $9.6 billion from recreation and tourism. Uh, reef tourism is a big business. People that can afford it will go around the world uh, to dive on the most beautiful and interesting reefs. And then the last thing is, one of the big frontiers for drug discovery is the oceans. I don't know if I've talked about this much, but if you think about it, corals are, okay, they've got soft, hard skeletons, but there's still that soft tissue on top. And there are lots of softer bodied invertebrates growing on a typical coral reef, uh, sponges and soft corals, you know, sea slugs and things like that. And they're soft and they can't get away. What do you do in such a circumstance? What a lot of them do is become toxic. Um, and the fun thing about toxins is that they're a great place to explore drugs. Um, as the 16th century um, doctor and alchemist Paracelsus once said, the dose makes the poison. An awful lot of poisons can be life-saving medicines if you take them in the right dose. And of course, a lot of medicines can be deadly poisonous if you overdose on them. And sponges and corals and things like that have been actively looked at and are continuing to be actively looked at as possible sources of, um, of drugs. In fact, I found this out. In the 1950s, some researchers were looking at sponges and they found a class of chemical compounds inside sponges uh, that were very effective in at killing cancer cells, at least in the laboratory. It turned out that what they were able to do, uh, what these compounds did, was they looked like DNA nucleotides, but they weren't. So if you dosed a cell with these false nucleotides, it would try to incorporate them in its own DNA and or RNA, and then find it wouldn't be able to. Uh, they would jam up the DNA replicating machinery, much like a bent staple can render an entire stapler utterly useless. The actual compounds from the sponges turned out not to be useful as a drug, but the basic idea of what we now call nucleotide analog drugs uh, was developed from these discoveries in sponges in the 1950s. And even though there's no single compound from a sponge that was usable as a drug, the basic idea of how we could get a drug to work that way came from studies on sponges. And nucleotide analogs include everything from oh, AZT and other anti-HIV drugs, uh, acyclovir, uh, the drug of choice against herpes infections. Uh, there's a cancer chemo agent called gemcitabine uh, that's also a nucleotide analog, and uh, remdesivir, uh, which is currently being uh, tested for its efficacy against COVID-19. Um, I think the president got it uh, when he was treated for COVID-19. And I think I, I heard that remdesivir may not be all that useful for most patients, but there are other nucleotide analogs that are being tested even as we speak. And we got the idea for how to make these things from studying sponges back in the 1950s. And there's more where that came from. Uh, there's a huge amount of biodiversity that nobody has really been able to look at yet. And it was estimated that we could, if we could preserve the world's coral reefs, we'd average 5.5 billion coming into the economy 
from the future development of drugs and possibly other products as well. If you want to go see one of these coral reefs, you probably ought to go pretty soon. Uh, there's concern that most of them will be gone in 50 years. And I'll leave you with an attempt to give you a sense of what we might be losing if we lose these habitats. So sermon over. I uh, will go ahead and stop the recording now. And...